Welcome to today's webinar in recognition of the last day of National Psoriasis Awareness Month. Welcome to part two of our webinar series, More Than Skin Deep, Management of Psoriasis in Females Across the Lifespan. To receive continuing education credit for this activity, you must take the pre and post test. If you have not taken the pre-test um, and you are viewing this webinar live, you will find the pre-test link in your room reminder email, and the post-test link will be sent to you after the webinar. If you are viewing this webinar on demand, both the pre- and post-test links can be found below this video. In the webinar dashboard, you should see a chat box that you can use to answer questions throughout the webinar, which our faculty will answer at the end of the webinar. In four weeks, you will receive an email from ARHP's Education Department with a link to a follow-up evaluation. We ask that you complete this evaluation to let us know how you have incorporated what you have learned during this webinar into your work. Completing the pre and post test as well as this follow-up evaluation helps ARHP ensure we continue to meet your educational needs and interests. Thank you in advance for your time and feedback. At this time, I would like to introduce our faculty, Dr. Anthony, Anthony Fernandez and Dr. Karen Scott. Dr. Anthony Fernandez serves as both Associate Medical Director in the Center for Continuing Education and Director of Medical Dermatology at the Cleveland Clinic, and as an ass Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine with the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. He is a dermatologist and dermatopathologist who re whose research interests include autoimmune diseases like psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Dr. Karen Scott serves as an obstetric hospitalist for the OB hospital group at Alta Bates Summit Medical Center in Berkeley, California. She also serves as a visiting professor in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Kenyon College in Gambier, Ohio. As an inter interdisciplinary scholar, her clinical and research interests include the analysis of individual, institutional, structural, and historical factors that inform sexual and reproductive care access, acceptability, availability, and utilization. We're thrilled to have them both with us today, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Fernandez. Thank you, Chantel. Before we get into the presentation, it's important to mention that this educational activity is made possible through an independent educational grant from Novartis, and we are thankful for their support. This slide shows the members of the ARHP planning committee as well as their disclosures. As you can see, most individuals have nothing to disclose. I am a speaker, a consultant, and do research that is funded by AbV. And I'm also a speaker for Celgene, and both of those companies do make medications that are used to treat patients with psoriasis. Our learning objectives for this afternoon are first to describe the epidemiology and subtypes of psoriasis through the reproductive lifespan of women in the United States, to identify knowledge gaps concerning diagnosis and treatment of psoriasis, to apply counseling and patient education techniques to facilitate discussions that support sexual and psychosocial health in women with psoriasis, and finally to select appropriate treatment strategies for managing psoriasis in women across their entire reproductive lifespan. So let's begin with an overview of psoriasis. Psoriasis is a common chronic immune-mediated disease that predominantly affects the skin. And it is thought that it has a multifactorial etiology that includes not only a genetic susceptibility, but also involvement of environmental triggers that lead to immunologic dysfunction. And it's important to recognize that psoriasis is a heterogeneous clinical disease. There are numerous different subtypes of psoriasis and each of these presents with skin lesions that may vary in morphology, in anatomic distribution, as well as in overall severity and disease course. However, when most people think about psoriasis in their mind, they typically will visualize well-circumscribed red plaques with silvery white scale, and that is the most common subtype of psoriasis, as we will see later. 
And psoriasis is very important because it has a very significant negative impact on patients' quality of life, and this is due to a number of factors, including physical symptoms, emotional distress, and overall social burden of disease. And it's also important to recognize that psoriasis is currently incurable. We do have outstanding treatments for psoriasis. However, in general, treatment is considered a lifelong process for patients affected by psoriasis. And it's aimed at controlling symptoms and at putting the disease into remission as opposed to curing patients. In terms of epidemiology, psoriasis is extremely common. It affects about 2 to 3 percent of the entire world's population, including about 2 to 3 percent of the United States population. And this translates to about 7.5 million Americans with psoriasis, or a prevalence of about 1.5 to 5 percent. And this is thought to be on the rise. And with this many individuals affected, there is a tremendous burden on the U.S. healthcare system with approximately $112 billion spent each year caring for patients with psoriasis. Psoriasis affects men and women equally, and it is most commonly seen in adults. However, patients at any age can be affected by psoriasis, and we do see even infants with psoriasis on occasion. The mean age of onset is roughly between the ages of 15 to 20 years, with some research reports suggesting it's closer to the mid-20s. And there is a second peak where onset of psoriasis is relatively common, somewhere between the ages of 55 and 60 years of age. So there are a significant number of young individuals affected by psoriasis, and thus a significant number of women who develop psoriasis during their key reproductive years. Luckily, the majority of patients with psoriasis are characterized to have mild to moderate disease, and the minority are characterized as moderate to severe disease. The etiology of psoriasis is not completely understood, but as we mentioned earlier, we think it is multifactorial in nature. There are specific genes that have been identified that predispose patients to psoriasis, and uh, family history is also thought to be an important risk factor for developing psoriasis. But there are a myriad of environmental triggers that we believe are very important to, to actually trigger that onset of immunologic dysfunction that leads to psoriasis. Some of those are mentioned here and include tobacco, alcohol, certain infections, hormonal changes. Although we do not understand the pathophysiology of psoriasis completely, we have learned a lot about it over the past 30 years due to uh, a wealth of research. And our understanding of psoriasis is really summarized in this slide. In patients with a genetic predisposition, some external trigger initiates activity in cells in the innate immune system, including keratinocytes and T cells. And they release pro-inflammatory cytokines that activate myeloid dendritic cells. Activated myeloid dendritic cells then engage cells of the adaptive immune system, Th1 cells via interleukin-12 and Th17 cells via interleukin-23. And those cells release additional pro-inflammatory molecules that then activate keratinocytes to produce antimicrobial peptides, additional pro-inflammatory cytokines, and chemokines, which act back on cells of the innate immune system. And that creates the, a loop of inflammation that we currently do not know how to completely shut off, and therefore the disease is persistent and incurable. And this un understanding of disease has allowed us to develop targeted medicines that have revolutionized our ability to control even the worst cases of psoriasis, and we'll briefly discuss these in the future. The end result of this immunologic dysfunction is that patients develop characteristic cutaneous lesions of psoriasis. And those changes that result in psoriasis can see, be seen at all levels of the skin. On the left of this slide, we have a photomicrograph of normal skin. 
the uppermost layer is a cellular. It's called the stratum corneum, and you can see this basket weave loose pattern. Underneath that is the epidermis, which is composed mostly of keratinocytes. And below the epidermis is the dermis. And in normal skin, you can see there are very few inflammatory cells present. And on the right, we can see in psoriatic skin, there are significant changes in all three of these levels. In the uppermost layer, the stratum corneum, it is compact, thickened, uh, and has this pink color. And that translates visually to that thick gray scale that we see in patients' lesions who have psoriasis. The underlying epidermis is significantly thickened, and this is because whereas in normal skin, a keratinocyte will divide every 28 to 30 days, the immunologic dysfunction in psoriasis causes keratinocytes to divide every three to four days, and this layer gets very thick and cellular. And then in the dermis, you can see numerous inflammatory cells. Uh, and that's a byproduct of that immunologic dysfunction. So let's spend a few moments and just briefly discuss some of the different psoriasis subtypes that you may see in your patients. And we'll start with plaque psoriasis. This is far and away the most common subtype. It accounts for about 80 to 90 percent of all cases. And this is the subtype where patients present with well-demarcated erythematous plaques with that thick silvery white scale. And these lesions most commonly occur on extensor surfaces, such as the knees, the elbows, the scalp, but they can occur anywhere. Guttate psoriasis presents with an acute and diffuse onset of numerous erythematous papules, some of which may have thick silvery scale and areas they can coalesce into plaques. And the typical presentation is in an adolescent or a young adult following a streptococcal infection, such as strep pharyngitis, but this can occur outside of that. Inverse psoriasis, in many ways, is the opposite of plaque psoriasis, whereas plaque psoriasis predominantly affects extensor surfaces. Inverse psoriasis affects flexural surfaces, the axillary vaults, the inframammary areas, the groin. And it tends to lack that thick silvery scale because these anatomic locations tend to be moist. They're skin folds. Skin tends to touch skin. Pustular psoriasis presents with psoriatic plaques as well as pustules. And this classically occurs when patients with psoriasis are placed on systemic glucocorticoids that are then tapered relatively fast. And pustular psoriasis often presents with a severe cutaneous rash with numerous pustules, but also systemic symptoms that may require the patient to be hospitalized. Erythrodermic psoriasis implies that at least 90% of the patient's entire body surface area is covered in psoriasis, and this can be associated with severe itching and psychologic distress. SIBO psoriasis tends to affect the scalp and has overlapping features of not only psoriasis, but also another common inflammatory skin condition called seborrheic dermatitis. And psoriasis also commonly affects the nails, and changes in the nails can include pitting, onycholysis, where you get this yellowish discoloration of the nail plate because it's separated from the underlying nail bed, and also thickened and even crumbling nails. And the female genital area can also be affected by psoriasis, most commonly in the setting of inverse psoriasis. In this, these cases, the labia majora is commonly affected, but the mucous membranes are not affected. And lesions will typically present as very well demarcated erythematous thin plaques, with or without scaling. Remember, inverse psoriasis, because these anatomic areas are moist, tend to lack that thick silvery scale. And patients will often complain of itching. Importantly, when it affects the female genital areas, it's often misdiagnosed as some other condition, such as a, an infection or an allergic reaction. And it's important to make the correct diagnosis because this can profoundly have a negative effect on patients' quality of life and their sexual health. In one study of almost 500 patients with genital psoriasis, it should be no surprise that those who did have genital lesions had a significantly worse quality of life than those without. And in particular, sexual distress and dysfunction 
was prominent in women with genital areas affected by psoriasis. In patients with psoriasis in general, there are a number of physical symptoms that patients may complain of. The most common being itching, skin pain, scaling that gets on skin or clothing and even furniture at home, uh, problems with the nails, and even dry, cracked, fissuring skin, especially when the palms and soles are affected. So how, when we suspect a patient may have psoriasis, how do we make that diagnosis? Well, most often it's clinical, and it's done through doing a thorough medical history and physical examination and review of systems. And when looking at these skin lesions and talking to patients, we have to consider other entities in the differential diagnosis. And for example, for plaque psoriasis, there's an extensive differential diagnosis, just some of these diseases are mentioned here, but there are other important diagnoses to consider, including secondary syphilis, subacute cutaneous lupus. And with that said, we usually can feel very confident about the diagnosis just based on our clinical evaluation. However, in situations where there is any doubt, then we will perform a skin biopsy. And those changes histologically, as we saw a few slides previously, can be very helpful in arriving at a definitive diagnosis in such patients. Once we do make a diagnosis of psoriasis, we have to assess severity of disease in order to make an appropriate treatment plan for the patients. Part of that severity assessment includes estimating the amount of body surface area with cutaneous disease. The National Psoriasis Foundation has published definitions of disease severity in terms of body surface area, with mild disease being defined as less than 3% of a patient's body surface area affected. And you can think of 1% of your body surface area as being the area of a single palm and finger. So a single hand, that's about 1%. Moderate disease is defined as anywhere between 3 and 10% body surface area. And severe disease is anything greater than 10% body surface area. It's also important to assess patients for comorbid diseases that commonly occur in the setting of psoriasis. This is a very important point. Psoriasis nowadays, especially in its moderate to severe forms, is considered a systemic inflammatory disease. It is not just a rash that patients have, and we need to treat them with this in mind. And this systemic inflammation is well known to be associated with increased risk for numerous comorbid diseases. Some of those are listed here and include, for example, psoriatic arthritis, which is a seronegative inflammatory arthritis that affects about 30% of patients. Importantly, the vast majority of patients who develop psoriatic arthritis will first develop cutaneous psoriasis, and that can be years before onset of psoriasis. And this can present with different patterns of disease, often overlapping. But the most common patterns are a peripheral arthritis that affects joints of the hands and the feet. But it can present with a spondyloarthropathy, where the spine and the hips are involved. And also dactylitis, where individual digits are diffusely swollen. Also important is that there is a vast amount of literature showing that there is an increased risk for cardiovascular events in patients with moderate to severe psoriasis. And this includes myocardial infarctions, strokes, peripheral arterial disease. And patients need to be educated about this. And there are the other comorbid diseases that are listed here are also well known to occur with increased risk in patients with psoriasis. Importantly, looking at just body surface area involvement on the skin is not enough to assess the overall severity. So in assessing the overall severity to really generate a good treatment plan, we need to look at the body surface area involvement, as well as the anatomic locations that are involved. So a patient may have mild body surface area involvement, less than 3%, but if the areas involved are the palms, the soles, the face, and the genitalia, that can have a significant effect on patients, palms and soles, Patients may not be able to perform activities at work or even activities of daily living. And the face and genital areas, as you can imagine, uh, 
create significant psychosocial dysfunction and uh, stress for patients. So we need to look also at that impact on the overall quality of life and, of course, presence of comorbidities. For example, presence of psoriatic arthritis, regardless of severity on the skin, will immediately move us, in most cases, to a systemic treatment regimen that we will recommend. So once we assess severity, what are our psoriasis treatment options? And before we talk about those options, new treat-to-target goals have been developed by an expert panel of dermatologists. And it is now believed that our target should be, with whatever regimen we prescribe, that patients have less than 1% body surface area on their skin after three months of treatment and during the maintenance period afterwards. And it is also agreed upon that it's at least reasonable or acceptable that the patient have less than 3%, so at least in the mild disease range. And this correlates with a very low level of systemic inflammation and therefore low risk of some of those important comorbid diseases we discussed. So in looking at treatments, we can consider topical treatments, phototherapy, and a variety of systemic treatments. For topical therapies, these are considered first-line treatment in patients who have mild disease severity, but they can be used as adjunct treatment in patients with any degree of disease severity and topical corticosteroids are clearly the cornerstone of uh, topical therapy in psoriasis. And importantly, topical steroids range in strength from low potency preparations to high potency preparations. And there are a few things you need to consider when prescribing a certain potency and vehicle. For one, the area is being treated, the patient preference and age, especially in terms of vehicle choice, and then pregnancy. Topical medicines or topical steroids are pregnancy category C, and we need to educate patients about the risks and benefits of using these. In general, we use the lower potency steroids in the areas of the body where skin is relatively thin, and we use mid or high potency corticosteroids on the trunk and the extremities. Phototherapy can also be very useful. It can also be used as first-line therapy in patients with mild to moderate disease or used in combination with other therapies with any stage of disease. And typically includes narrowband UVB, Sorlin plus UVA, or eczema laser. And the benefits of phototherapy is that it lacks the toxicities or immunosuppressive properties of systemic medications. And it may be a preferable option to use in patients who are pregnant. And it tends to be pretty effective uh, depending on the, the patient or what else is used in combination with it. Importantly, PUVA or Sorlin plus UVA should be avoided during pregnancy. Sorlin is a medicine that intercalates DNA and causes mutations. The other thing that's important about phototherapy is it will not control systemic inflammation. So it is not a good monotherapy for patients with severe disease. And it also requires frequent office visits. Typically, this is scheduled every two to three times per week. And so it can be logistically difficult for patients who work or have to care for other children to attend these appointments. And long-term treatment is similar to spending too much time in the sun. It causes skin damage and increased risk of skin cancer. In terms of oral therapies, the traditional therapies include methotrexate, cyclosporin, and acetretin. Methotrexate is still a very common treatment that we'll use with uh, for patients with psoriasis, either alone or in combination with even biologic medications. Importantly, this is pregnancy category X, so it cannot be used in patients who are pregnant or considering pregnancy. Cyclosporin can be very effective and is rapidly effective, so patients who are significantly uncomfortable, we will use this to try to get control of their disease quite fast. It is pregnancy category C, and we do monitor for nephrotoxicity and hypertension in these patients. Acetretin is generally less effective than other traditional systemic therapies. It does tend to be more effective when used in combination with narrowband UVB phototherapy, and it is also pregnancy category X, so cannot be used in pregnancy. And in fact, we typically will not even consider this in women of childbearing age because it has such a long half-life, patients cannot even get pregnant 
for months and months after their last dose of acetretin. A premolast is a new oral medication considered a small molecule inhibitor. This is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor that's approved for both moderate to severe psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And individual studies have also demonstrated its efficacy in treating nail psoriasis and scalp psoriasis. Its most common adverse events include gastrointestinal symptoms and uh, there's some increased risk of depression. And this is pregnancy category C. And over about the past 10 years, the advent of biologic therapies has revolutionized our ability to control psoriasis. And right now, there are essentially four categories of medicines. The anti-TNF inhibitors, etanercept, infliximab, and adalimumab. These are pregnancy category B. Ustekinumab is an anti-IL-1223 inhibitor, also pregnancy category C. There are three anti-interleukin-17 inhibitors, secakinumab, ixakizumab, and brodalumab. There is data concerning use in pregnant women for secakinumab. It's pregnancy category B, but we're awaiting data with the other two. And within the past few months, the first anti-IL-23 inhibitor, Qselcumab, has been uh, FDA approved. And again, there is no current uh, available data. So we are spoiled today with the treatment options that we have for psoriasis. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to give the next half of the lecture. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Now we will discuss management of psoriasis in females across the lifespan. Listed are several noteworthy questions that clinicians can utilize to frame conversations with women around the relationships and interactions between reproductive health and psoriasis, particularly those women who are thinking about them, planning, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and menopause. We will explore these issues later on throughout this section. We encourage clinicians to initiate conversations about pregnancy intention and timing when engaging women of childbearing potential. We also recommend having discussions about medications to avoid while trying to conceive. Specifically, planning the timing of treatments allows women and clinicians to determine the minimal treatment necessary for the duration of pregnancy. For example, a woman who experiences remissions that average one year following the course of PUVA can plan to finish their most recent course before attempting to conceive. Most systemic medications require discontinuation before trying to conceive. Methotrexate should be discontinued at least 12 weeks before trying to conceive. Retinoids, such as the ones listed here, have been linked to birth defects and should also be discontinued before trying to become pregnant. And women of childbearing age who take acetretin must use reliable methods of birth control during treatment and wait three years after discontinuing the medication to become pregnant. Specific precautions surrounding the use of isotretinoin are listed here as well. There are limited data in the medical literature that supports psoriasis skin changes with the use of hormonal contraception. When thinking about quality, of life experiences around sex, sex for pleasure and or reproduction, we know that genital psoriasis can cause irritation and discomfort during intercourse, adversely affecting the person's capacity to enjoy sex and possibly become pregnant. Unfortunately, patients with genital psoriasis may avoid sexual activity like any other form of psoriasis, the goals are management and minimization of flares while provision of social, emotional, mental support, particularly for genital psoriasis. One strategy to minimize genital discomfort includes advising patients with genital psoriasis to cleanse the affected area and to reapply medications or emollients after intercourse. When exploring data on psoriasis and pregnancy and birth outcomes, 
we have estimated that over 100,000 deliveries occur annually in women with psoriasis. We recognize the difficulty in counseling and supporting pregnant patients living with psoriasis. The uncontrolled inflammation and excessive amount of cytokines make for a very unpredictable and variable course of the disease during pregnancy. Elevated sex hormones, especially estrogen and prolactin, play an important role in modulating the immune response during this time. So what facts can you share with your pregnant patients about their prognosis? We know that approximately 50% of women experience a clinical remission of their psoriasis during pregnancy while others may have a worsening of their disease and still others may experience no change. We think that the hormonal changes in pregnancy may play a role in improving psoriasis by promoting a state of immune tolerance. Almost half of the studies included in a systematic literature review of both observational studies and clinical trials detected an association between psoriasis and adverse pregnancy outcomes among women with psoriasis. These outcomes included spontaneous abortion, cesarean delivery, low birth rate, microsomia, large gestational age, composite outcome of prematurity, and low birth weight. We must note that associations were not always consistent across studies. Thus, we need future research to include large cohort studies with multivariate modeling. I apologize, I'm having some difficulties here. Give me a couple of seconds. I may need some assistance. I greatly apologize. Hold on one second. Give me my okay. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So since we're talking about treatment of psoriasis in women of reproductive age, it is noteworthy to uh, for us to discuss the various FDA pregnancy categories for drugs as a gentle reminder, which Dr. Fernandez did show. Now, in terms of psoriasis treatment in pregnancy, this algorithm provides a suggested sequence for psoriasis treatment in pregnancy using a step-like approach. Topical treatments, including emollients and low to mid-potency topical steroids, are considered safe in pregnancy. Higher potency steroids could be considered next, but should be reserved for second or third trimesters when possible. Narrow band UVB or broad band UVB is recommended as second line therapy for patients who fail to improve with topical treatments. For patients who do not respond to phototherapy, systemic corticosteroids in the later trimesters can be used, but with caution given the potential for rebound flares during withdrawal. Alternative approaches such as cyclosporin and TNF alpha inhibitors may be considered with close medical monitoring and supervision. As always, we prefer the clinicians avoid systemic medications during the first trimester. This table lists, lists specific psoriasis therapies and their assigned pregnancy category. Of note, in 2015, the FDA replaced the former pregnancy risk letter categories on prescription and biological drug labeling with new information to make them more meaningful to patients and healthcare providers. Prescription drugs submitted for FDA approval after June 30, 2015 used the new format, while labeling for prescription drugs approved on or after June 30, 2001 will be phased in gradually. Medications approved prior to June 29, 2001 are not subject to the new rule. However, the pregnancy letter category must be removed by June 29, 2018. 
As clinicians, we must be mindful of the anxiety, worry, and concerns of breastfeeding women about the safety of commonly prescribed topical and systemic medications during lactation. We know the safety data in lactation for some medications used for psoriasis are somewhat limited. Thus, we designed this table to list some of the topical and systemic medications used for treatment of psoriasis and their safety in lactation and breastfeeding. No known risks are associated with the use of moisturizers. For our patients who are lactating and require treatment, we recommend topical corticosteroids before systemic corticosteroids. Likewise, for our patients who are taking systemic corticosteroids, we advise they wait four hours after treatment before breastfeeding. We realize we have much to learn about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis during pregnancy and the safety of the medications used to treat these conditions. The current information available to us relies on pregnant women who voluntarily share their journey in a confidential manner. To improve the quality of our information, we recommend and really encourage that all pregnant women participate in a pregnancy registry regardless of the type of medications used to treat the psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. It's important to note that pregnancy registries are strictly observational, which means your patients are not asked to modify anything about their daily lifestyle, including the medications they are taking. Menopause, like other life course changes in women's reproductive health, such as menstruation, pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding, does in fact modulate the natural course of psoriasis. A decrease in estrogen during menopause is believed to be a major factor in the occurrence or exacerbation of psoriasis flares in patients already suffering from psoriasis. Furthermore, reduced estrogen levels are thought to lead to insufficient Th1 cell-mediated response inhibition, playing a major role in the pathogenesis of psoriasis. In a study conducted by Moad et al., Menopausal women had an exacerbation of psoriasis in 48% of cases, while only 2% showed improvement. Overall, one in three women noticed a significant connection between their psoriasis and hormonal changes. Given the known increased risk of cardiovascular disease with psoriasis and that the leading cause of death among women is cardio cardiovascular disease, caring for women with psoriasis allows for focused interventions to improve overall health and well-being. Psoriasis severity is associated with diabetes, insulin resistance, smoking habit, and a higher cardiovascular profile. Studies found that metabolic syndrome is related to age and menopause, but not to psoriasis severity. Likewise, a higher waist circumference has been observed among women with psoriasis. As clinicians caring for women with psoriasis during the significant time in their life course, we need to, be, we need to openly engage patients in, support and, in supportive and transparent conversations about their skin, their heart, and their head. Let's explore now additional considerations for caring for women with, who are affected by psoriasis. As you can see here, psoriasis is associated with a high rate of psychiatric comorbidity, which often goes unrecognized and subsequently inappropriately diagnosed and untreated. We must be mindful of the higher prevalence of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and varying levels of shame, embarrassment, and unattractiveness. Recent work has identified that pathological worry and anxiety occur in at least one-third of patients with psoriasis, and that psychological interpersonal difficulties impact all aspects of a person's daily life. Moreover, feelings of embarrassment and unattractiveness, as well as altered body image, contribute to the psychological distress that patients with this disease suffer from. 
In a study that examined health-related quality of life issues in patients with psoriasis, women with psoriasis reported nearly twice the mean number of mentally unhealthy days compared with men with psoriasis. There is a growing body of literature that supports some link between major depressive disorder and inflammation based on the elevation of proto-inflammatory, excuse me, of pro-inflammatory cytokines reported in major depressive disorder and inconsistent dose response with the severity of depression. However, we are unsure whether the depression is causing the inflammation or vice versa. Psoriasis has been shown to have a major negative impact on patients' quality of life. Research has shown that patients with psoriasis have a reduction in their quality of life comparable to or worse than other patients with chronic diseases such as cancer, arthritis, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, and depression. The data describing the relationship between stigma and living with psoriasis and the impact of stigma on self-esteem and the inability to develop relationships is well established. As you can see, many factors beyond the disease itself impact the quality of life of our patients living with psoriasis, such as lack of agency and autonomy, shame, and social isolation. A recent U.S. non-interventional study evaluated 101 patients' experiences of living with psoriasis and using narrative interviews conducted at baseline and within 16 weeks. The authors evaluated seven impact areas, including emotional, social, family, professional, physical, educational, and sexual. In interviews, patients with moderate or severe psoriasis indicated symptoms ranked symptoms according to level of bother, and indicated areas of their lives affected by psoriasis. The most bothersome symptoms included itching, scratching, flaking or scaling, and skin pain. The most frequently reported impact areas included emotional and social, again, underscoring the complex and dynamic social, emotional, and mental harm and need of our patients living with psoriasis. This slide shows selected verbatim statements from patients who participated in the study just described. As you read the statements, I encourage you to continue to reflect upon the ways to acknowledge the physical, social, emotional, and mental concerns and challenges of our patients living with psoriasis. For some time, we recognize that psoriasis can adversely influence sexuality, sexual relationships, and sexual health in a substantial number of patients. Scientific evidence shows a higher risk of sexual dysfunction among patients with psoriasis compared with the general population. The risk factors associated with sexual dysfunction in patients with psoriasis include severity, female sex, age, and psoriatic arthritis. Genital involvement also significantly affects sexual function. In an observational multi-center study of 354 psoriasis patients, we see that 38% reported current genital involvement, 63 reported current and or prior history of genital involvement, 42% reported dyspareunia, and 43% noted decreased frequency of intercourse and one in three reported worsening of genital psoriasis after intercourse. When evaluating patients for psoriasis, we strongly recommend obtaining a thorough sexual history, including questions around sexual pleasure and satisfaction. Likewise, providing support to patients to find best approaches to discuss health, sexual health, and skin care with their partners is also very essential. Here we offer some practical recommendations to share with your patients with psoriasis who desire sexual relations and or seek sexual pleasure. We also encourage you to possibly step out of your comfort zone and consider communication and collaborations with trusted sexuality educators, counselors, and therapists based on the patient's and or partner's sexual needs and priorities.
While many options exist for the treatment of psoriasis, nutrition is a therapeutic component that should not be overlooked. Dietary modifications have shown to induce a, excuse me, a statistically significant improvement in clinical psoriasis. In several studies, including a large-scale study of over 12,000 patients, previously established a correlation between psoriasis and celiac disease. Based on this association, a reasonable hypothesis could be that a gluten-free diet can improve celiac disease with subsequent improvement in psoriasis. Several studies have also demonstrated trends in improving psoriasis with the implementation of a low-calorie diet versus a free diet, calorie-free diet. In addition to various diets, multiple oral and topical nutritional supplements have been shown to improve clinical psoriasis. For example, vitamin A is best utilized, me, vitamin A is best utilized when complemented by additional treatments, both oral and topical preparations which have been shown to be quite effective in treating psoriasis. Low serum levels of vitamin D have been shown to low levels of vitamin D correlate with more severe psoriasis. So as with vitamin A, oral and topical formulations of vitamin D are known to be quite beneficial in treating psoriasis. Topical use of vitamin D in combination with topical corticosteroids is also most commonly used. And the addition of supplements in combination, such as selenium, coenzyme Q10, and vitamin E, also improve severe forms of psoriasis. There is some support for the use of omega-3 fatty acids in the improvement of psoriasis. Alcohol negatively impacts psoriasis in the most adverse manner. In a meta-analysis of 15 case control studies, they demonstrated a statistically significant association between worsening psoriasis and alcohol consumption across a number of stratified analyses. Frequent moisturizing is a cornerstone of skin care for patients with psoriasis. Patients should use moisturizer at least twice daily and place after applying any topical medications to help improve penetration and efficacy. Moisturizing more often may be helpful to thicker psoriasis plaques and moisturize immediately after bathing within one to two minutes to trap in the moisture. Ceramid-based moisturizers are excellent and your patient will really appreciate the wide variety of over-the-counter options that are available. In general, in terms of efficacy, ointments are better than creams, which are then therefore better than lotions. Patients should be advised to use gentle cleansers and avoid antibacterials, excessive cleansing, and fragrance products. Sunlight may help improve psoriasis plaques, so sun exposure may be useful only if the patient does not get burned. Caution is advised as sunburns can flare psoriasis since this disease commonly flares in sites of trauma. Treating women with psoriasis involves more than just managing their type of psoriasis. Consideration of the cosmetic and aesthetic aspects is a vital part of helping women, patients cope with their disease, and be able to look and feel their best. While many clinicians may not feel comfortable or have the time to get into a conversation with their patients about cosmetics, having a fundamental knowledge about what might work for patients regarding makeup is recommended. Patients should start with a cleanser formulated for sensitive skin. We have described a list of tips and best practices to share with your patients. The web link listed below serves as an additional resource for patients about foundation selection and application. Between 50% and 80% of patients with psoriasis develop lesions on their scalp ranging from slight scaling to thick, crusted plaques that cover the entire scalp. 
Scalp psoriasis makes your patient and their disease more visible, which can be an especially frustrating and humiliating manifestation of the disease, leading, leading to even greater emotional distress. Symptoms of scalp psoriasis include dry or brittle hair, intense itching, and dandruff-like flakes. Special shampoos available for patients with scalp psoriasis contain ingredients designed to reduce inflammation and soften and loosen scales on the scalp so they can be washed away. Two main types of psoriasis shampoo are cold tar shampoo and medicated shampoo. The active ingredient in the latter may be a corticosteroid or thos acid. Again, we ask that clinicians be mindful of the diversity of hair washing frequency and hairstyling practices of your patients with scalp psoriasis and engage in conversations about hair care. Patients need to be educated about the, impl about the implications for hair dyes and perms, since the chemicals in hair dyes can sometimes irritate and worsen scalp psoriasis or even cause an allergic reaction on top of the psoriasis. Patients with this type of psoriasis may want to learn more about various hair styling techniques to help camouflage their psoriasis, such as extensions, braids, wigs, hair wraps, and scarves. Caucasian, Asian, and Hispanic patients often prefer steroid solutions. And we found that some African-American women patients often prefer steroid oils. We do advise avoiding ointments, possibly in creams and lotions and scalp psoriasis, but maybe use if patients prefer. Ketoconazole may be added to a regimen to treat the SIBO psoriasis. And we advise that you counsel your patients to shampoo with gentle massage using their fingers' tips to loosen the scales. Steroid oil treatment overnight prior to washing will also help soften, loosen scales regardless of hair type. And regarding racial and ethnic considerations, we found that underreporting and selection bias may contribute to observed differences in the prevalence of psoriasis in underrepresented populations. Racial and ethnic disparities in access to a dermatologist have been reported in the U.S., and the likelihood of having undiagnosed psoriasis was found to be much higher among African Americans in a national study analyzing NHANES data from 2003 to 2004. In darker skin types, psoriasis may have overlapping features with other papillus squamous disorders and have less conspicuous erythema thus presenting diagnostic challenges. Key nuances in the clinical presentation of psoriasis in the, in skin of color include observing less conspicuous erythema, which may appear hyperpigmented. Post-inflammatory changes can be either hypo or hyperpigmented. There could be a potential increased area of involvement, body surface area at initial presentation. And particularly among African-American women and girls, we must consider the impact of hair texture, styling practices, and washing frequency. Additional key treatment nuances to be considered include phototherapy and darker skin types. And we should have a brief discussion about increased pigmentation, excuse me, about increased pigmentation in these exposed areas. Selection of a topical treatment regimen that is compatible with hair care practices and cultural preferences. We also want to note that traditional Asian healing practices, such as cupping, coining, and other herbal remedies, are examples of factors that may be relevant to the clinical presentation of psoriasis in some patients. And the use of some herbal medicines can potentially be associated with drug drug interactions. Complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM, is the general category of products and practices that are not part of the standard care offered by medical doctors. CAM use is common among patients with psoriasis. Example of CAM use 
For psoriasis, are shown in the slide and include dietary supplements such as fish oils, vitamin D, vitamin B12, herbal therapies such as tea tree oil, dead sea salts, and aloe vera, exercise, and acupuncture. It is important for clinicians who treat patients with psoriasis to be aware of the potential benefits as well as side effects associated with these alternative therapies to allow for informed conversations with their patients. Now we're going to move on to our case study. Here we have a 32-year-old black female U.S. born who plans to become pregnant within the next year. She presents with a four-year history of worsening itching all over the head and white flakes shedding from the scalp, which have increased in size. The hair is described as thick, coily, and worn in long, unrelaxed states, meaning no current use of chemicals to straighten her hair. Pertinent to her history is the appearance of scaly, itchy patches on her inner thigh that occurred during adolescence, which were never treated by a physician, and but resolved after four months. Also, regular salon application of hair straightening chemicals occurred during the adolescence that resulted in severe burns and sores. The clinical exam reveals erythematous raised plaques with silver scales on the scalp, some areas of thick hyperkaryotic plaques extending beyond the hairline, creating an asymmetric plaques on the forehead and glabella. A diagnosis of scalp, psoriasis, me, of scalp psoriasis and plaque psoriasis was given. In terms of treatment, we offer clobazol ointment to the affected areas every 12 hours for up to two weeks. We also added adalimumab on day one. The treatment was initiated with an 80 milligram dose, and then by day eight, we began every other week dosing with a 140 milligram pen, and then by day 22, we continued every other week dosing with the same pen. It's important to also note that we collaborated with the patient's obstetrician and discussed with the patient the intentions and timing around pregnancy and also the expectations around postpartum. And the important part here is to include strategies to reduce and eliminate potential trigger factors, as well as, again, talking and discussing and planning for safe and effective medications for pregnancy and breastfeeding. And again, we also discuss hair care guidance. So now, um, thank you, Tony and Karen, for that excellent presentation. Uh, let's on to a couple of questions. Um, first question comes from Stephanie. Are there any contraindications with contraception methods? Any, any <laughs> contraindications to contraception in patients with psoriasis? Yes. No, I mean, not, not to my knowledge, no. Yes, I agree. Not, there, no, there aren't any contraindications to different types of uh, birth control used with a person living with psoriasis. I agree. Um, and next question from Mark, are there any internal side effects from topical steroids? And how often do topical steroids have to be injected? There are definitely adverse effects of topical steroids um, internally, and and so w when you're putting topical steroids over a relatively large body surface area, you will absorb enough of that glucocorticoid into your blood that it's similar to taking prednisone. So the side effect profile when you're using a, a lot of topical steroids is the exact same side effect profile as a patient taking prednisone. And we have had patients who have developed adverse effects such as even osteoporosis because of um, misuse of topical steroids. Um, in terms of injecting steroids, we do that occasionally. I, we actually did that for a patient within the past week. And it's, it's usually a, several focal lesions that are just stuck 
you know, in a patient who's otherwise well controlled. And of course, injecting the glucocorticoid really just deposits that medicine where you need it. Whereas when you put it on the skin, regardless of how strong it is, it has to penetrate through that very thick upper layer of skin before it gets to the inflammatory cells, if you remember that picture of that histologic slide. Thank you for um, answering the questions. Um, we will hand it back over to Tony if you could review the key points before we conclude. Sure. So the key takeaway points in pregnancy, topical steroids are considered first-line therapy. Phototherapy, specifically narrowband UVB, second-line therapy. And you can use medicines such as cyclosporin and TNF inhibitors as third-line agents or in patients with severe disease during pregnancy. Whereas about 50% of women will experience remission during pregnancy, there is a significant potential for psoriasis flares postpartum. Decreased estrogen during menopause may contribute to exacerbation of psoriasis. Self-esteem, ability to develop relationships and sexual function are adversely affected by psoriasis. Dietary modifications, including a gluten-free and or low-calorie diet, have demonstrated significant improvements in patients who have psoriasis. Moisturizing the skin is a cornerstone of general skin care in patients with psoriasis. And it is important to consider skin care, makeup, and hair care for treatment of women with psoriasis. And finally, there are disparities in undiagnosed psoriasis as well as access to treatment that are prevalent among ethnic and minority populations. So thank you for attending this afternoon. Okay. Thanks again, Tony and Karen, for joining us today. Before you exit this webinar, please note the following. Um, there is a, a patient infographic in the handout section and go to webinar for you to download. Uh, please be sure to visit ARHP.org to do um, in view part one of the webinar series um, on demand. Also, as a reminder, you will soon receive an email from ARHP's education department containing a link to the post-test survey. Your CME RCE certificate will be generated at the end of the survey. Be sure to print the certificate before closing the internet browser. And if you have any questions, please email us at education at ARHP.org. A copy of the slides will be available in core on uh, ARHP.org. Uh, thank you for taking the time to view this webinar. We hope you will take part in another live and on-demand activities hosted by ARHP. <laughs>